Hello, everyone. My name is Eric K. Thomas, Editor-in-Chief of the Quinton Central Gentleman, and today we are sitting here with Keith Powell and Ricky Robinson of Secrets, and we're going to get to learn all about their secrets and how they are uh, have created a platform to help us and other people kind of grow and uh, climb this corporate ladder, um, but thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. How are you doing today? Doing good. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm doing great, man. Awesome, awesome. So we have Keith Powell, also known as KP, yeah. you know, which got it. And then we also have Ricky Robinson, also known as PR. Now, I don't know how the PR happened. I'm not getting that one. Well, I mean, you know what it is. It's uh, it's pretty Ricky. You know, unfortunately, I used to get teased when I was uh, when I was younger. Uh, and then it uh, just it just stuck and, and landed, you know, there. And I think, um, you know, it's just one of those things, you know, once your friends get something, they don't let it go. <laughs> they don't let it go. They stay with it. I get it. I get it. Um, so yeah, let's start off. I want to get a little background on each of you. I want to know, uh, we'll first start with you, Keith, and just uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, so uh, my background, I actually was born in North Carolina, grew up mostly in Virginia Beach, um, and um Went to Virginia Tech for undergrad, got my master's at Indiana, and um, went to college in Lynchburg College. So uh, did I didn't you? Do it all. Yeah. All right, all right, yeah. And um, uh, my background is in finance, so I uh, had a had a long corporate career in uh, in finance, um, working my way up the up the corporate ladder for a, for a long time. Got to the top, uh, lost my breath. And uh, <laughs> decided to pivot and try some other things. So I pivoted, uh, pivoted out of uh, corporate America into um, private equity, which I don't know if that was the best choice, but I did what I did to try it out, see how people actually make make money out here. Um, and there's a lot of money out here that we don't know about. So you know that's the reason they call it private equity because people want to keep that to themselves. And uh, and now I've actually moved into education. So I'm a, a chief operating officer for a, for a school and loving it. And uh, and Ricky and I, along my corporate path, we met up along that path where I was the CFO. He was the chief chief HR officer, and uh, which is probably two purple unicorns in the same room never happens. And, you know... <laughs> We've been friends ever since. We, you can't tear us apart now. So <laughs> and we decided to launch secrets. So. And Ricky, your background. Yeah, so my background, uh, maybe a little different, you know, than, than Keith. I mean, we both probably paid the dues to, to be where you are in terms of the education. But, you know, my background, uh, born in Oklahoma, grew up in uh, Los Angeles. And um, if you can imagine all of the, the 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 jokes I used to get. We talk about how PR came about. Like with some of my friends now ask, how many street lights did you have in your neighborhood in Oklahoma? I'm like, man, we had electricity, man. What y'all talking about? You know? Right, but uh, I grew, right, up in, uh, grew up in LA um, in the time when there was the gangs and all of this stuff and going to college, you know, it had it not been for sports. So I played football, ran track, played basketball in uh, high school and was lucky enough to be able to play football and run track, you know, in college and um, ended up... Um, uh, going to you know West Virginia for uh, about a year and a half, two years before transferring back to Southern California and then to San Francisco State, you know where I got right. my uh, BA and my master's, you know degree, and um, been in the Bay Area. I moved around, you know, a little bit. Moved to uh, Tennessee. Moved back to LA, to Tennessee, then back to the Bay Area where this is home. And I've just been really lucky and fortunate to be able to have some really good roles in human resources. So I've actually sat in every function within HR, from staffing and recruiting to comp and benefits to employee relations to, you know, now being the chief HR uh, officer for an aerospace, you know, uh, company and whatnot. So, you know, I've, I've had those opportunities and will probably be, you know, um, doing some other things at some point, you know, in my career, you know, but, I, you know, helping people was something that kind of came easy for me. Like that was what was um, maybe placed into my DNA, you know, so to speak, in terms of having that village mentality. So I luckily uh, for me, I, I I get paid to be able to 
find people jobs, you know, so to speak, or to be able to create cultures that are comfortable, you know, for folks who don't always look like us. So, so that's, and, and to Keith's point, we ended up meeting, you know, at work and it was like, I remember going into the boardroom one day, actually I met Keith at the airport, you know, cause we didn't have an office, you know, back then I'm like, it's another brother that's going to be working in the boardroom with me, right? It's like, send somebody else there. And we just ended up, honestly, at the end of the day, you can imagine when you have one, you know, African, you know, American, Black, whatever, you know, person in a corporate environment, how many people migrate or navigate, you know, to you, whether it's Black or Brown, now you have two, you know, in there. So it comes about where everybody wants to talk to Ricky and Keith, right? And it's just no way for us to be able to mentor and guide every single person and still be able to do your job at a high level. So what it ends up being is we end up starting like a podcast because we're just like, we wanted to be able to reach people at scale, you know, there yeah. to be able to do that. So it's almost like why you go to school and get all of the education is because you want to be able to maximize your potential. Well, we wanted to be able to maximize how many people we could impact, you know, there. And that's kind of how we started thinking about you know, our responsibility, you know, to the village, to the community, as it relates to people being able to see, you know, what they aspire to be. All right. Well, great, great lead in. I was going to say, so what is secrets? I'll get either, I guess, either one can jump yeah. in. So again, like Ricky was just saying, I mean, we started it um, as a way to reach people at scale, because we've mentored, like, hundreds of people uh, during our career. Um, and obviously we can't have our days filled with 10 and 20 minute meetings with, with a bunch of people all day long. So we said, let's, let's find a way to kind of scale this thing. And so we decided let's start out with a podcast because we were literally Rick and I was sitting um, at my kitchen counter uh, drinking a little vodka and cranberry and uh, just now we do. We, we, were at the, we were in the studio. You know, put it that way. Uh, in the studio, <laughs> right. The studio, yeah. and, and, and look, Keith is being nice, you know, about some of it. I remember saying, you know, to Keith, we were trying to figure out how we could do it. And Keith was like, man, we should do a podcast. And what I said back then was, Keith, ain't nobody going to listen to this, man. <laughs> I said, and now Keith, right. how many, like, episodes are we in how many downloads like you know yeah. so I think we're, we're getting close to 100 episodes and you know about 30,000 30, followers um yeah and, and the thing is it was like yeah Ricky is right because we're like who wants to listen to this dry corpus stuff and 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 all of that stuff but it turns out we keep it fun we keep it light um we keep it real also um, just in terms of we realize um, by being authentic, you know, it really connects with people and um, they really like to hear what we got to say. Uh, you know, and, and it's yeah. another thing, like when you think about like the uh, like what we wanted to create with the secrets, you know, platform and secrets is basically a, we, a play on words, but see sweet secrets, you know, mm -hmm. because the way Keith got it to, to his level in his career was maybe a little different than the way I got to my level in my career. So we talk about our trials and tribulations going through uh, corporate America. We talk about a lot of the, I'm going to try to keep it clean and PC on here. We talk about a lot of ish, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like uh, in corporate yeah. America, and some of it makes you sick to your stomach. But again, we, we talk about topics like, look, we all got families and somebody is wayward. Somebody else needs some money or this, that, and the other. And oftentimes they call you while you're at work. Okay, so we talk about how do you deal with that external static, but still hit your corporate objectives or your functional objectives? How do you, when someone is talking slick to you, that's like probably yeah. not a microaggression, that might be a macro, you know, aggression. And then we talk about like, yeah. everybody wants to get to the next level. How do you do that? Like what all needs to be true for you to be able to move to the next level? And I, yeah. I know in my career, I thought I was ready. But at the end of the day, Eric, I was far from ready, you know, to be able to move forward. We're telling people those lessons that we were able to get, you know, much later on in our career. They're coming out of school. They're coming out of their first, second job, under trying to understand what is total compensation? How do you negotiate for it? All of those things. So, again, our aspiration or hope for Seekers was to be able to give people the information that we wish we would have had. We want to be able to give it to them now, but ultimately our real goal is to impact the generational wealth. I mean, every day that you don't get it, you're further and further behind the eight ball and all of those, you know, um, uh, statistics that we see, you become a part of that, 
you know, so what we want to do is to knock that, you know, uh, completely around and just to, to make sure that we do get people what they're worth. No, I definitely understand. And I think, you know, someone I, I quit my job last November, uh, November during the great resignation uh, to do the quintessential gentleman full time. Um, and I was a digital marketer for a, in the legal industry at a law firm and I did that for years and there is you know from having your conversations or the conversation that you're having it's not a one size fits all right you know it's not that if you do this I'm not you know you guys are not telling them do this and this is what's going to happen it's this is my experience but you're able to take away bits and pieces of the things that you're saying and apply it to your particular situation because ultimately corporate America as a whole is the same thing. We all kind of deal with the same thing, especially as being black and brown people. And I think there's like a fun, there's a fundamental or even a foundational setting that we all kind of start at to where you are dealing with various issues that are very similar, you know? Oh, for sure. We've been we've been surprised. I mean, we have people all over the country. And in fact, we got people who listen in, in Europe and Asia, and it's all the same, which tells you that, you know, kind of that corporate environment is a system. And, you know, and part of what we do, too, is bring in other guests, you know, other people who've also made it to the top or people who are aspiring to, to get to the top to hear their experiences also. Because, again, like you just said, it isn't a one size fits all. We, you know, we've all... Um, had our different paths to to the top and so it's just always but there's always these synergies or connecting points where we realize ha huh, you had something similar that was for me and you had some things that were different um, but we're all in some ways experiencing some of the same things as we try and get to the top also and be able to kind of break those barriers is what we're all about yeah so. and, and that's a great point Keith but I think there are also like some of those things Keith that you and I know that everybody needs it at every, yes. every level and, and for, for us what we found is now we may say it a little bit differently than most people but we say it so that the marginalized folks can understand it right so i mean the first thing that, that we always that we know everyone needs at every level is they need marketing collateral like they need to make sure that you got your resume tight we're in corporate america because the folks are looking at your linkedin they're looking at your Twitter, your Instagram, like all that. Well, I don't know about Twitter now with my man, you know, running things, but you know, they, they're they looking at everything, you know, <laughs> so, but we, we right. call that, you know, like your marketing collateral. And then we know some of us have been out the game for a long time. So you got to figure out how to interview or what is it? You got to go through this self-discovery. What is it that you actually want to be? We call that getting your mouthpiece tight. You know, like you, if somebody asks you something, you got to know how to answer that question. <laughs> you know, whether that's like what you're looking for, how much money you want. And I think the other part of that is, so we practice, you know, with individuals on how to interview and how to do those things, how to look for a job because the game has changed significantly. So how to network. And then I think the last thing for us that Keith and I, you know, uh, really take our time with is helping our clients or our, our customer base, like our secrets village, help them become like, um, help them find their voices, help them be able to figure out what to post about, you know, what to talk about, like, how do you become a force to be reckoned with like that? That I mean, that's really been part of the box that we've been put in, you know, for so long as, hey, it's not okay to say this, or, hey, you don't do this, but really being able to be a thought partner, you know, out there is part of it. So although every situation, is, you know, everyone has a different, you know, hurdle that they need to overcome. Those are the four areas when Keith and I sit back and we think about, Man, if I wish that if we, if I'd had this back then, I'd be dangerous, you know, right now. And that's usually yeah. like where we end up kind of focusing a lot of our, you know, individual coaching, but some of the similarities that we've seen with every uh, one that you know comes to us for uh, for help. Of course, of course. So if someone uh, makes this, makes a statement and says, uh, you know, black and brown people, you know, really can't. Uh, succeed in corporate America and that they should, you know, go out and be an entrepreneur and do their own thing. That's the true success. What would you both say to that? I'll start. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Keith. I'll let you start because I, I feel like Ricky ready to go. I'm gonna let him simmer on it. <laughs> Look at that. I'm, all, yeah, I'm, I'm over here boiling. <laughs> he is. He's already rocking. <laughs> right, right, right. Right, you're singing the old Negro spirituals, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> ready to go um no, but, i mean at the end of the day i mean 
there is a path in corporate America. And, and you know, at, that's where the money is, too. I mean, it's, it's hard to start a business. So, I mean, I've advised a lot of startups um, during, my, during my time, and it's really, really hard. And people don't understand how hard it is. And, and getting that hustle is a very different kind of mentality and mindset and all the things to really, to really, really be good at it, right? Wait, and what do you work. mean? Are you saying that what they show you on social media is not true about being an entrepreneur? It's not all roses? No, and that's the thing. I mean, you hear about the ones that, that make it because it's rare, right? It's newsworthy at the end of the day, right? You know, there's tens of millions of people every day trying to get their hustle on and one or two or three break through um, at the end of the day. So it's really hard to, to be an entrepreneur and to um, and to do that. Um, and so corporate America, in a way, you know, if it's done right, and you know the tools and the tricks, which is Rick, what Ricky and I have been trying to give to everybody, you can create a very nice lifestyle for yourself, right? Um, and But you just, like any other thing, you got to know what you're getting into and have the right mindset about that also. And so that's part of what we try and do with our coaching services is get your mind right. Because if you want to be a VP, there are sacrifices you're going to have to make to be a vice president, whether you like it or not. And so we just tell you what it is um, that you got to do and the sacrifices that you're going to have to make um, in order to get to the top if that's where you want to be. If you don't want to be at the top, that's fine too. You can still live very well and do very well. So. I always I tell people there are a lot of rich number twos. Okay? <laughs> like, exactly. There are people who are good at, you know, helping other people to be that focal point, you know, and I think that uh, everybody's not meant to be an entrepreneur. Everybody doesn't have it. And you need to figure out what works best for you. And there's ways to be successful without, you know, owning your own. So, but um, come on, come on, PR. Yeah, let me, so, let me so. hear it. So, so I think uh, which which is interesting that that uh, we're we're talking about the entrepreneur thing because that's a decision that Keith and I, you know, had to figure out also, right? And it's like, do you, you know, like you just did, Eric? Do you just say bye and I'm gonna hit this full time, or do you try to operate this like a side hustle, right? And this is no different than trying to make a decision to quit your job, right? And and or I'm gonna keep this job, but I'm gonna be looking for something else. So. At the end of the day, there's a process, you know, for being able to do that. And that's where we take people through, whether it's you're listening to the podcast itself, and we talk about how to have a side hustle or knowing when to quit your job. Me and Keith have both been in those situations or, hey, you, as we're seeing right now, it's a large number of people whose positions are being eliminated, you know? So how do you kind of prepare for that stuff? So what we try to do and what I refer to all the time is we have a section in our podcast and in our, in our shows where we call it the receipts and the receipts are the facts, right? We're not making stuff up. I know it sounds like we sensationalize the things when we're talking about our own experiences, but there are receipts, facts, statistics that back up what we're saying, okay? And that's where it kind of validates it. But then at the end, we give people um, our secrets, you know, on how to deal, you know, with whatever that dilemma, you know, is there. But one of the receipts is, there's a whole bunch of businesses that fail. And now you're talking about just a few people get through there. So if you're and if you're doing the old math or you're doing the new math, if you know that 90% of uh, uh, new businesses fail, then you really got to have your stuff together. You really got to be strategic and you really got to plan that. You know, and oftentimes we jump out there because it's a good idea, but we didn't think about taxes. We didn't think about, you know, all this other stuff and it becomes more than what you anticipated. So we're, we're fans of being able to create your own wealth and to be, you know, have your own business. But we we ask everyone, whether it's leaving a job, getting a promotion, um, whatever the case is, we ask people to be prepared to understand, you know, what your self-discovery moment is. Look at those receipts and understand this may not work out, you know, and then also make sure that you have a strategic plan, you know, that you can tactically execute against on a regular basis. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So 
Talk to me a little bit about people um, that you've kind of come across in your experience that are working as a job and then versus the career and identifying the two, right? Because I feel like we're in this space where people are doing jobs to do jobs, um, but then there are also people who have a career path and kind of figuring out how, how important it is to realize, is this a job or is this a career? And you, it being a career then has the elevation piece of it too, where you go up that corporate ladder to become, uh, you know, better and more invested in uh, the particular industry that you're in. I'll go back to you, Ricky. Yeah, well, you know, obviously, you know, me being an HR, you know, uh, professional and doing this for a whole bunch of years, um, this is something that I talk to people about, you know, are regularly. And when I maybe when I finish, maybe talking about the difference. I mean, Keith can give a real life example of how his career was really intentional and how it, you know, uh, was able to be set up. But we we look at, you know, a job is something that you go to every day and it's a means to being able to pay the bills. Like you're not really going hard. You know, you could kind of jack off half the week, you know, and then uh, come Wednesday or Thursday, you get that work done, you know, real quick, <laughs> right. right? That's a, that's a job. And, but that also means you don't really have a lot of control. Like your destiny is in someone else's hands. When they, when they realize they want to automate that role or when you become expendable because your role is not revenue generating or something like that, then your control is in someone else. So a job is something that kind of meets the needs and you're not really concerned too much about being on succession plans. You're not too much concerned about getting a promotion or getting certain reviews. You're just like cool with, with just kind of being in the background. A career is maybe a little bit different, you know, like in our minds, whereas you may be the manager now and an individual contributor, but you may have dreams or aspirations to be a VP, a chief, right. to run your own business. That takes a little bit more strategy in terms of the career. So when you go to a uh, to an organization, you're trying to see what how many people look like me, you know, in those leadership roles. You're trying to see how often do people get promoted? Is there a training or a development plan, you know, associated with it? How often are we it, it, number one, you're looking at like the 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 movement. You know, there are people that look like me, have my background, my pedigree. Are they moving in the organization? So those are some of the mindsets or the things that you consider when you're talking about a career. And a career doesn't mean, Eric, I know how mom and dads did it. That don't mean 25, 30 years at one company, right? Like just yeah. going in there yeah. and get this paycheck. <laughs> tell, hey, like my dad told me, tell them. You, you, you come in early, you stay late, yeah. you're a team player, yeah. you catch on fast. You know, like that, that's exactly. not what we're talking exactly. about. We're talking about the intentionality with the roles, the organization, the, the responsibilities, all of those types of things. That's what we're talking about in terms of career. But I know Keith, you know, KP, his, 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 his career path as he was, you know, kind of talking about it quickly really was intentional. And I, you know, it's great for Keith to be able to maybe uh, talk that through real quick. No, it, it, it was, and I, I find myself to be very lucky um, because Rick and I talk a lot a bit about about mentorship versus sponsorship. You know, mm -hmm. where where mentorship is kind of someone kind of points you, you know, through the fog. You know, if you're trying to find that that island that's over there in the fog, the, the mentor can point you and say, "Hey, the island is over there." Right? Yeah. A sponsor is gonna pick you up in their boat and drop you off you know, on the shore of the island, right? And so I was lucky right out of the gate, right out of business school with my my uh, fancy MBA um, to get sponsorship, like from my very first boss. And, and he literally, we put together like a 10 year plan. He said, these are, if you're gonna be a, a true finance um, executive and wanna make it all the way, here's, here's a map for the next 10 years of, different experiences and things that you need to have and have in your have in your pocketbook um if you want to if you want to be a finance executive and even though that boss ended up <clears throat> leaving the company about three years later you know when i'm about two steps into the plan it still carried with me and he handed me off to someone else and even though they left i still had the plan and so i just started following that plan and i literally you know within 10 years kind of became like central casting for finance, right? And was quickly 
mow through a whole series of roles, put on succession plan to be a CFO, you know, and just and work my way through it. And that, you know, it's, I've really been fortunate in that way of having people who who sponsored me every step of the way. Um, mm -hmm. No, that's that's awesome. Um, I want to talk a little bit about education, right? So we, you know, hear all the things, the student loan debt and people dealing with all of that. And the education piece kind of boils into, definitely boils into corporate America. Um, you know, my opinion, personal opinion is, you know, we're really at a disservice when you go from high school to college with an idea of what you believe that you want to do in your life. You get this degree, there's like a percentage, I think it's like 80 something percent of people do not um, actually work in the jobs that they actually got their degrees in, right? So from my my idea and how I would tell my kids, if I have some, will be going to go to high school, do internships. You don't have to go straight to college right out the gate and um, try to figure out what you want to do. Because if I could do it over, I would, you know, I went to school for law. Uh, I went to school for law and not a lawyer, um, even though I worked in the legal industry, which is a whole different conversation, but it just happened that way. But what I would do is knowing what I know now, I would have done like a junior college, got my feet wet, got a job. And then I realized, oh, I love marketing. I would go back and get my degree in marketing because now it's specialized in something that I actually um, like to do and I agree with. I want to know what your thought process is on the educational system and that path to working and kind of that longevity of like living when you do have the education piece of it that you kind of have to get in order to get a good job you have to have the education but then now you get the job and you're not necessarily working in what you uh either what you got your degree in or you're working in what you got, got your degree in and realize that you don't really like it um but i'll go back to you keith yeah this that is, was a lot if, if if my answer was concise i if, I, if my question it was a lot it was well all over <laughs> It's an interesting question, that given that I work in education now, <laughs> it's uh, it's one that I'm I'm dealing with every every day, and um, because I, you're probably you're right in in certain sense in certain senses that the things that you learn in high school and even a lot of the stuff that you learn in college you never again use in your life, right? And so um, a lot of it is about having those life skills. Um, that are really going to carry you through um, through your through your entire career. Those are the things that are the most impactful at the end of the day, and probably where, where we should be spending more of our time. You know, just in in education and really getting getting people prepared to be a whole person, um, as opposed to like trying to pigeonhole kids into like um, specific things. And that's why, like in Europe, for example, that's why they have a gap year. Right. It's like get out of high school, take a year off, explore the world, figure out who you want to be, and then um, think about college or trade school or whatever the case may be. Um, so, so I, I, I think I kind of, I, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying and agreeing um, in some aspects of what you're saying. The tough part is if you really want to start to build the generational wealth and and buy all those things. Um, the system forces you to 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 make a call and make a decision, and so that's where the where the dilemma comes in, right at the end of the day. So, yeah, and it's funny when when Keith, when you say the system, you know, here and it kind of dictate dictates like what what you do. Um, look, Eric, at the end of the day, we didn't make the rules. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't make the rules at the end of the day, right? Because we know if we'd have made the rules, the game would be different. The results would be you know different. But I think. Part of like this whole, whether you should go to college, whether you should take time, where do you go to college? Well, first off, if we're talking about the system, the system is not set up for all of us to be able to have the same education in the first place. We can go back to redlining. We can go back to, to the constitution. We can go back to whatever, you know, it is. We can go back to the court system now, like, but it's not set up for us to all win. Okay. And when we right. do win, like the prize is not, you know, always the same. So again, one of the first things that I uh, think about, if I could say to, you know, 17, 18 year old Ricky, you know, uh, you know, 50 year old Ricky and 17 year old Ricky, you know, a whole, you know, way different, you know, I would also yeah. say you got to do some self-discovery. What is it that you, what is it that really brings you joy? You know, what is it that you really want to do? And what are the different ways that you can do that? 
you know, and that's if it if if you do the pros and the cons and more of it means you got to go to college, you know, to be able to do that, then that's the route you take. If it means that college is not necessary, you're still going to have to hustle. So whether you're going to college or you're going and you, you're doing your own thing, you got to hustle. And some of us, we know it, you know, don't have the hustle bone or the hustle gene in our body. Then you might need to kind of think about what that looks like. You might be in a more structured, you know, environment, you know, or some other uh, resources for you. But I think ultimately, if you can get closer to what it is that you want to be, you know, what do you, what do you want to be when you grow up, you know, so to speak, I think you can figure the college thing out. Now, again, if we go back to, to, to the receipts, you know, or the statistics, it shows that, you know, more people have college education to be considered for corporate jobs or that, and that usually trumps overall work experience, you know, at the end of the day. And then if we look at, who's getting promoted or who has the generational wealth is generally those people who went to college, <laughs> you know? So all I'm saying is at the end of the day, if, if money, you know, wealth, those things are important to you, movement in your career, then probably college, some form of it. Like, look, I went to a junior college. I didn't get the best grades in high school. I didn't get the best grades in college. Had it not been for sports, I may not have even went to college. Like I always tell people the truth there. But once I got in there, I'm like, I want to compete. You know, I want to win. I want to, I want to have nice things just like everybody else, right? And it dawned on me that the 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 common gene that everyone had in that was that hustle gene, right? Either you were hustling and you were hustling doing your own thing and trying to figure out how to ma mastermind that, hustling in school and trying to figure out how to compete, or when you got out of school, hustling, trying to figure out. How do you get to the next level? And at the end of the day, that's the, the, the essence, you know, of secrets. And that's really not like a, a, a real, you know, secret, so to speak. But Eric, me, you and Keith, we've been hustling all our lives. That's all we know. <laughs> you know, we grew up with relatives hustling and we're just telling the secrets and making it corporate, making, making it corporate so people understand it. Mm -hmm. And I go back on what Ricky was saying about self-discovery. I mean, I was literally, I was like um, a student the whole thing and i was directed towards engineering right he was a smart yachty eric he tried to tell you he was a smart nah, yeah, yeah. exactly exactly <laughs> don't hate the player don't yeah, hate the player exactly. don't hate he's the player. like he's like i don't understand what you guys are talking about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean i was like directed to go towards engineering right and i i was getting uh c's in chemistry and physics and and those things right and, uh, you know, a teacher said to me at one point, it's like, you would be like an amazing business person that so you should really just think about that. Uh, and I thought about it. I mean, I was applying to college for all these engineering schools and engineering programs, and I was getting in, but I would have been a horrible, horrible engineer, dreams would be falling, planes would be falling out the sky, all that stuff, right? <laughs> so... Just that little self-discovery moment kind of changed my trajectory also. So it's really, um, as Ricky was saying, having at least having that time. And that's why I think like gap years could be important too, because it gives you that moment for time to pause and really do some self-discovery about what you're passionate about um, at the end of the day. If I knew young Keith, what I would tell young Keith, if I was a counselor, <laughs> I would say, Man, you might want to be an engineer in the kitchen because Keith be trying to cook his ass off. You know what I'm saying? That's what he be trying to do. Or, or right. he could he could be an engineer at the at the bar, be a good bartender. That's oh, like that's, that's some of his hidden yeah. talents, you know, right there. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. Um, uh, my next question, you know, the pan the pandemic really shifted corporate culture from like this remote working space, right? Where you know the idea was, oh, you can't work from home because you're not gonna you're not going to work. Whereas we come to find out that was a lie. I know I was working harder, working from home, proving that I was working than I was because I know I'll get my coffee breaks and I'm sitting there talking with the coworkers for 30 minutes in an hour. At home, I'm working, right? And I'm working past six o'clock, doing things at night, all of those things. Um, but I want to get you both uh, thoughts on what do you see the corporate landscape two years from now? and that remote working, because we had the conversation where there's a whole bunch of hybrid positions now, then you have people going back to the office and forcing people to go back to the office. 
I want to know if you think or project that this will be normalized or um, will we go back to all being in the office or is it now an idea where the remote thing kind of did work and we're going to stick with that? Any thoughts on that? You know what? That's a great question. And we, we both deal with that today. And some of our clients are asking us about it. some of our corporate clients are asking us, hey, what, what do you all believe this to be? So what we refer to like what we have today versus what may be you know, in the next few years, we we refer to that, and it's not a new term, but it's the future of work, you know, so when we think about the future of work, we've, back in the day, we were told you got to be in the office, you know, every day, again, so I can see you working, this, that, and the other, but we know if it was March, we was doing fantasy, uh, was it, uh, uh, doing our NCAA <laughs> tournament stuff, you know, like it was all these things that would kind of, they would see us, but it didn't equate to, and you could stay late, but it didn't equate to like success in the role. And there were work-life balance, you know, issues with, you know, things that you were missing. You were in traffic half the time. So old school says you got to be in the office every day. Well, even old school had to change. And truth be told, Keith and I were remote workers over 10 years ago. That's how we met. You know, our office was at the airport when we, when we, when we met each other. Right. But, you know, old school, had to kind of catch up because the thought was we're going to lose all of this money. All these companies are going to shut down and some smaller organizations did shut down. So I don't want to be disrespectful to that, but the larger organizations figured out a way how to make it happen. And then the truth behind the matter is in the years of the pandemic, when we were all shut down, so to speak, there was record profits at organizations. Right. They made more money. So because you are waking up to your point earlier, logging in all day, not getting dressed, not having to get beat three hours in traffic, you know, get, getting to and from work and now working later because you were at home and you can do it. Now that has burnout from a different category, but now it's new school is starting. I mean, old school is trying to like re, what, revert back to what it was before. So we, we go from totally remote now to hybrid, you know, from hybrid to being able to normalize what it was before. So this is, you know, very cyclical, you know, right now, I do believe there are some organizations who will get it right, you know, but I would, I am not surprised that more people are trying to get back into work. This is no different than, um, than the social justice, you know, movement, right? Where all of these companies were giving money because it was the right thing to do and they didn't want any smoke. Okay. But now if you went back and you asked about that money, continuing to give money, sweat equity, that's well, you know, we kind of have like that diversity fatigue, you know, we've been through a lot, you know, it's like now we're kind of back to it being the way it was before. And that's where right. things will end up being going like the future of work will return back to what almost very similar to what we saw, you know, somewhat before it, it uh, right. being in the office does not equate to uh, good performance. What they try to equate it to is collaboration. But during the pandemic, if we made more money and everybody was at home and we were collaborating, you're going to have to give me a different definition for it. Keith, I know you have a, a, a point of view, you know, on this as well. Well, my provocative point of view is that this whole return to work thing is all about power and privilege <laughs> at the end of the day, right? Um, because we've already proven that we could do it now. And as Ricky said, I mean, I, I worked before the pandemic, I had worked remotely for eight years and got promotion after promotion after promotion. Um, during that time frame. So it's not a matter of can work be done remotely and can people be productive and can people move up the ladder? It's really about, you know, again, this systemic thinking of I need people here that I can touch and feel and control, you know, um, as opposed to what, what do we need to do to get the work done, right? Um, at the end of the day. So I'll stop there because that, that's basically how I feel about it. But but that's not provocative. Provocative is if you, if you might have mi mixed a lie up in there somewhere, but I don't think a lie was told, though. No. <laughs> no. If, 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 if they tell you, hey, Eric, if they told you you had to be at work five days a week now, your first response is going to be like, why? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So and if the why doesn't pass the smell test, you know, again, this is the whole job versus the career thing. Let me see how long I need to find to keep this job, get these bills paid, till I find something where I can be completely remote or I can come in hybrid, you know, so to speak. So again, as, as employees who want to be in cultures where there's opportunity or where the environment is a little different, the employees yeah. have the ability to drive the culture if they really want this, you know, here. 
Um, yeah. Again, that's a, a lot of stuff about the great resignation and, and that moment of clarity, you know, for folks. But I do think uh, it's uh, a bit of a farce, to be it honest. Is. And we talked about the receipts. I mean, we did a couple episodes on this. And I mean, the receipts, the receipts show that um, microaggressions have gone down for black and brown people, you know, just in terms of their experience. We don't want to go back into the office because we don't want to have all of that mess to deal with, you know, at the end of the day. Um, it shows that, you know, women in particular being able to um, better do, uh, do child care um, and, and, and things like that. It's all been very helpful um, to have that flexibility and schedules and things like that. So there's plenty of receipts already out there that shows, at least for people of color and for women, it has been a definite advantage to be able to work remotely. And so that's why I keep saying when you're trying to force force people back to work, that's the privilege and power piece of it, the, the dynamic of it and why I said that um, earlier. No, I agree. And I think about, you know, real estate, you know, there's two pieces of it. It's one, now I got to justify this lease that I had for five years to get people in the office that I paid for this office building. And then on the flip side is, okay, this lease, we're going to let this lease go up on this building that is not, I've never seen offices fully utilized. I've worked at plenty of law firms and there's always a floor or two that is sitting there with no one in there, no desk being used or anything like that, right? So it's like, okay, the money that you're saving from a real estate perspective of these commercial buildings, let people go, you know, let them come in. I think there should be a space. I think for me, you have the choice. I understand. I know when I have something to get done and I need, it'll be better for me to collaborate in person. Let's all come in that day, have that meeting, do what we need to do. And I think it's giving people the option to be adults. You hired me for a job. I know the best way to do it because you expect I should do it because you hired me to do so. Let's figure out how to do it that way. So I definitely understand uh, the point of people just you know justifying the reason of giving uh, of making people go to the office for sure you better be careful Eric. they're gonna put you on a list like me and kp over here. you over here telling secrets you over here telling it like your ti is you know what i mean like they, this this is it you're talking about the simple stuff that we that we say here like it are are having snacks at the office you know or lunch really gonna make you go back to work exactly at the end of the day, like I have food in the house. You 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 know what I mean? Like, <laughs> am I going good dress? Go spend some gas money, sit in traffic to go get these free snacks or to get this exactly. dry cleaning. Like, exactly. we have to rethink the future of work is to kind of rethink the the value proposition, the employee value proposition. Like, what what's the value of me coming into the office? If if coming into office means I might get promoted more, okay, then say it. You know, if it means X, you know, then say it. So, but we have to. For two years, two and some change, we were creative about having virtual happy hours, about doing virtual onboarding, about meeting on with a regular meeting cadence. And, and people still got promoted. Like if we look at how many promotions that we can go back and pull information, it didn't stop. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Record profits tells you everything you need to know. All right, I want to get you both out of here. My last question for you is what advice would you or do you give? If you could give one piece of advice um, to, I would say, younger, uh, let's just say, I guess, what is this, Gen Z, right? Who just worked into, just got into the workforce, just got into corporate America in the job that they actually want, actually care about, and they're looking to progress. What would be one um, piece of advice you would give to that minority group, um, and I'll ask both of you to provide that answer. Keith, you wanna you wanna kick it off? Sure, sure. Uh, we talk about this all the time on Secrets. Build your village. Build build your village. You gotta have uh, people around you who are gonna support you, um, who are gonna give you good advice. They may give you bad advice, but they're also gonna hold you up. Oh, because that network. Um, is super, super important at the end of the day. That's because that network is going to help carry you through good times, bad times. It's also going to be the people that you rely on for mentorship. Um, some of those folks can maybe become your sponsors. Um, so just continue to kind of build out that village. Um, and in many ways, that's the um, more important sometimes than the skill set. Because, I mean, if you look, again, another receipt, if you look who's getting pulled through the system, it's not because a lot of times of their skills and ability is because they know somebody. 
right? <laughs> and so, um, and that's part of what we've been trying to tell um, our secrets listeners is like, you know, that's part of the game also. You can you could be the A plus student, the most technically skilled person, but if you don't have a network of people around you who believe in you or who are going to help pull you through, it's not going to work. Can I add a little quick, real quick before we get to Ricky? Can you yep. um, help me? How how do they do that? Give me examples of how to do that because I feel that you know I it's it's challenging, right? Because you you know, if you want to be in that space, you kind of gravitate, um, you gravitate to people that look like you, but oftentimes people that look like you are not in those spaces that yep. can help you to grow, help you to, they're y'all in the same, in the same boat. And then there's also part of not wanting to be like a kiss ass, you know, yep. or like up someone's butt or things like that. So I'd be interested to know kind of what your examples of, of how they can build that village. Yep. So when I join any job, the first thing that I ask to do is, um, I ask my boss to give me 10 people to talk to. I ask my boss to give me 10 people to talk to. And I also ask to talk to their boss, um, if they have one. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk to their boss and I want to understand from the, my boss's boss, what's important to them, um, and how I can help, um, help move the envelope, you know, what's important to you and how can I help in the role that I have. And then with those 10 people that my boss introduces me to, to have the conversations to understand, hey, what's your pain point? What's your, you know, how can my role help contribute to um, what you're trying to get done? So you'll start to like branch out that way to people that you wouldn't know. And then you can ask them if there's other people I should talk to, right? And so that's kind of how you start to build a network that way, but then you also need your friends and support or network also. And that comes more naturally with people, And you, but you can't stay there if you want to have a career. If you want to have a job, you can stay right here with your friends network. But if you want a career, you're going to have to branch out, and that's how I've done it. Yeah, awesome. awesome. Yeah, no, that, that. That, and, and, uh, and just to kind of add to a couple of key points as he was talking about networking, um, and having those one-on-ones, I think the intentionality behind what Keith is saying is like, it's easy to go to a job and be like, well, I'm gonna start doing that next quarter. I'm gonna do this, that, and the other. As Keith was saying, it takes some work, you know, to network, to be able to get into an employee resource group, to be able to connect with other members in the Divine Nine, if that's what you're a part of, or other people who went to the same college that you went to, to be able to go to the events. I understand sometimes we just wanna go to work, and we want to come on home, right? That's it. Sometimes <laughs> right. you got to stay after. You got to go to that networking event. They might be drinking beer, brown liquor, playing golf. Like you have to be able to kind of put yourself out there to be able to network because you have to do your part to bring the walls down and make people understand that, hey, I'm just like you. And then when Keith was talking about meeting with those 10 people, like that's the intentionality where we're saying it's up to you. You want something that they have to be able to go to them and say, hey, I admire what you're doing. I've already done my research to see where you went to school, you know, all that LinkedIn stuff. And hey, I see how you moved in your career. And, I, it, it, and again, it's not necessarily kissing the ring, but somebody has something that you want. So you have to be yeah. intentional and deliberate you know, about yeah. having a regular cadence of meetings. And it may be once a quarter, or, you know, twice a quarter or whatever the case is. But I think the one piece of advice I would tell folks is, the one thing that changed the trajectory of my career, the single most important thing was investing in myself. I worked in HR and I was trying to do my own resume. I was trying to do all of this stuff. But the minute that I um, invested in myself and I got myself an executive coach, and this was in my late you know, 20s, probably even early 30s, where someone did my uh, resume for me. Someone actually helped me with the same things that we do for our executive coaching clients. Someone did that to me, you know, and that wow. changed the game for me. I went from having something that I thought was good based off of my ego to something that I knew was good because it was a, a, an external um, professional, you know, that did that, but it cost some money. So once I got over okay, I can't go get rims on my car right now. I can't go get the new radio. I can't go get these new whatever it was, you know, um, uh, back in the day, I had to like focus on me. Like yeah. it, was a, it was a sacrifice, so to speak, I thought, but in the end, it was yeah. the best investment that ever, that I ever did because it was part, it was that that gave me the confidence that I could compete 
you know, and it was that that let me know that there was more work that I needed to do in order to get to where I aspired to be. So, you know, Keith's uh, idea was great. And I say this one is good too, because when you end up having those meetings with those 10 folks, you have marketing collateral. You've already, you already know what you want to be. You don't get in there and you get a meeting with the, with this, with this important individual and you're in there stuttering, uh, humming and humming and on, and you don't know what you want to do. You just, what do you want to do in your career? I just want to help people. I just want to help the organization. I, like those aren't, you're wasting your moment, you know, uh, there. So you got to be able to do that self-discovery. And part of that is as you invest in yourself, then you are ready, you know, for that next level, you know, in terms of having those conversations and being able to leverage those. That was awesome. That was awesome. Thank you both. Keith, Ricky, this was amazing. Everyone, please make sure you tune into their podcast, Secrets. Uh, we'll definitely have the information in our link. And thank you both, gentlemen. I appreciate it. We appreciate you too, Eric. Right on, Eric. We appreciate you, brother. Keep doing what you're doing. Of course. Thank you.